Good morning, everyone. I'm Bill Schmidt, uh, President and CEO of the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. Welcome to the PFF Summit 2017, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have a really big day today. Um, I'd like to start by thanking our fabulous summit co-chairs, Dr. Tim Blackwell and Dr. Lisa Lancaster of Vanderbilt Medical Center. You and the Summit Organizing Committee have done an incredible job, and we are very grateful for your time and effort to make this such an impactful summit. Tim, Lisa, and Summit Organizing Committee members, would you please stand right now? And let's give them a big round of applause. So today presents us with an outstanding opportunity to learn about new tools in our fight against PF. In just a few moments, you will hear from our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Greg Cosgrove. Dr. Cosgrove will announce a major new technology tool we are introducing to improve the quality of life for patients. You'll hear about the progress of our community, our, uh, the progress our community has made with the PFF patient registry and biorepository as we approach our target enrollment of 2,000 patients. Not only are we close to reaching our enrollment goal, but our sub-study committee has already approved five research proposals using data from the registry and biorepository. That's great progress. Our continuing commitment to research will require additional funding. We are working very hard at the foundation to expand and diversify our sources of revenue from our ever-growing base of support. This will be one of PFF's most important areas of focus for the foreseeable future. We are fortunate to be able to build on great momentum that many in this room have helped build. At today's lunch, you will hear from several companies conducting research in pulmonary fibrosis. In this first innovation series, they will tell us about potential new clinical trials and technologies. It should be very exciting. Thanks to our passionate volunteers, along with our terrific PFF staff team, we introduced a major new event, the PFF Walk in September during Pulmonary Fibrosis Awareness Month. I'm pleased to report our inaugural walk raised $238,000. Yeah. <clears throat> which was triple the amount we expected uh, to achieve the first time out. It also attracted uh, twice as many participants as we uh, anticipated. And we certainly plan to parlay the success of this year's walk into an even bigger event next year. In addition to raising money, we are focused on raising awareness among key constituencies and the general public. As many of you know, Chicago Bears running back and pro bowler Jordan Howard joined forces with the PFF at a volunteer conference in Chicago last year. Jordan unfortunately lost his father in 2007 after a nine-year battle with PF, so it's a very personal cause for him. <clears throat> Since coming on board as a PFF spokesperson, Jordan has auctioned PF-branded cleats, lent his image to a PF uh, billboard campaign and issued a successful, very personal fundraising appeal in memory of his father. Jordan will auction cleats for the PFF again in a few weeks during the NFL's Cleats for a Cause week. Stay tuned on our website for information about how you can bid on, on his cleats. And 100% of the proceeds uh, from Jordan's cleats will benefit uh, PFF. We must also make our voices heard in Washington, and we are. Our patients and their families have shared their stories with members of Congress, and I must say this is a critically important time to make sure that government and elected officials understand the research and care and other needs of this community. And so, this afternoon, we will present our government affairs strategy during the advocacy session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Greg Cosgrove, to take it from here. Thank you all very much for being here. Wow. 
Wow, just looking at the audience, uh, I was blown away yesterday. I think uh, walking downstairs and having a registration line that went probably about two to 300 meters. Um, sorry you had to wait, but to be honest, for me it was an incredibly exciting moment to see everyone and the enthusiasm. Uh, each and every year that we've had this meeting, it's grown and uh, we keep telling ourselves or asking the question, how can it get better each and every time? Well, it's pretty easy because we have people like Tim Blackwell and Lisa Lancaster leading the charge each year, and we identify new individuals that can make the summit better each and every year. So I'd like to personally thank them and the rest of the organizing committee and all the speakers in advance of the meeting because uh, I anticipate it's going to be another great event. Um, but I'd like to take us back a little bit and share some of the thoughts over the past couple of years. There we go. Um, the initiative that we started that Bill alluded to is a collective effort by everyone in this room and the patients that support us as we begin to understand and better evaluate those with pulmonary fibrosis. So depicted on this slide, it updated as of uh, this Monday with Rex Edwards uh, providing all the data, is we, since its inception, shortly over a year and a half, we've enrolled 1,516 patients at 40 centers across the United States with all-cause pulmonary fibrosis and in particular idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So this is a tremendous accomplishment and I'd like to uh, recognize all the centers and all the patients that volunteered because with their help we will better understand pulmonary fibrosis, identify the underpinning of the uh, cause of the disease and hopefully identify uh, continued or additional therapies to treat those patients, not just with IPF, but all cause pulmonary fibrosis since there's many more patients that have the disease than just those with IPF. And I'll explain uh, that the importance of that later on. Um, in particular, I'd also like to uh, point out uh, Kevin Flaherty, who's chair of the registry and CCN uh, steering committee for his tremendous efforts to make this happen. Um, but what I'd also like to point out that those care center networks provide resources as you saw, to specific areas which are ge geographically dis, uh, disseminated throughout the United States. It's a resource for those individuals, but not everyone with the disease has access to those sites. And in this slide, which is emerging data through a collaboration with MedFuse, we're starting to identify patients throughout the United States and better understand the gaps in areas and uh, that we perhaps can support better and develop relationships into the community where the, mo m the majority of patients are seen. So as we saw, 1,516 patients in the registry, which is a snapshot of where the, are the types of patients with pulmonary fibrosis and where they are. This is a representation of the 500,016 patients that we've been able to identify with the help of MedFuse uh, and categorizing the 163 million subjects in their database. That's an unprecedented ability to better understand where the patients are with pulmonary fibrosis, who's caring for them, the procedures that they've had, and hopefully target so that we can provide educational materials to those individuals who might not be able to directly access uh, the care centers. And we do that not only through um, our website, but also through contacting them, their physicians. And I think that the point is, as we move forward, which is represented in this slide, these are the top 10 diagnoses for individuals with uh, interstitial lung disease. And what's evident here is that while IPF is an important diagnosis, and these are the subjects just acquired from 2016 to 2017, so it doesn't represent all 516,000 patients, but it clearly identifies that pulmonary fibrosis represents a broad cause of uh, many different diseases that we have to pay attention to because the mechanisms, while they may be similar in some ways, they may be different and so therapies may be targeted for different diseases, all of which have significant and potentially catastrophic outcomes. And so the ability to contact them, and I won't go through the slide in particular detail, but what's represented on the far right column are the physicians that care for those patients. So 
when a diagnosis is made, perhaps the opportunity is to better support those physicians who may not have as much experience as those people in this room and set up that partnership and the relationship so that the, immediate, the immediacy of the diagnosis can be supported with education, support uh, through so the support groups that we're emerging and, and developing throughout the country and the United States. So it's exceptionally important through collaborations and working together not only with industry, with uh, the NIH as well hear from Dr. Kiley in the subsequent presentation, uh, the vision is that as a collective group, we can achieve significantly more to the benefit of our patients than we can do as one sole entity. And I believe, as Bill alluded to, the Foundation's role is really to try to help coordinate that and make a, a cohesive group of individuals. Um, so what I wanted to uh, represent on this slide is a disease that is relatively uncommon but affects many individuals, over 4,000 in the United States that many people don't understand nor have experience with. The 4,000 patients we identified with polymyositis, a disease that's incredibly important in autoimmune process, the power of having data, not only from the registry, but from a large cohort that we've acquired in collaboration with Medfuse, is that we're now able to better understand that disease, better care for those individuals, and it's a disease that perhaps many in the country, at least um, outside this room, may not even know about. So the power of knowledge and information can be immediately accessed and, and uh, move forward to help our understanding. But that's only be the beginning because, again, I go back to the slide where we see a significant number of patients throughout the United States. So in addition to setting up those partnerships um, within our network, we will expand because the increasing the care center networks is our goal to increase uh, the access. And so uh, in the first quarter, at the end of January, we will open up uh, the applications for the care center networks. For those of you who would like to participate, please look for that announcement. So we will expand not only in the capacity of the care center network, but in our outreach to in education, in our support groups moving forward. And th that's an opportunity that uh, I think we're excited to get uh, better involved in the community. Another way in which to access individuals who may not be able to travel. Patients with, uh, on, with pulmonary fibrosis have tremendous difficulties, and we'll hear from Susan Jacobs and her uh, investigators at this meeting the challenges of oxygen therapy, the limitations of the support for many patients. So another way to access them and perhaps provide resources uh, is through a web app that as of 7 a.m. on the iTunes store you can download. So it's PF Health app that we are collaborating with Monarch Biotechnology Systems, which will provide information. It is a research tool moving forward, and it's, again, a way in which collaborating with individuals throughout the United States and, and frankly, throughout the world will allow us to impact the lives of patients with pulmonary fibrosis and advance the research, whether it is at a care center ne network site and registry um, uh, collaborations with our partners or through research that can now be done on your iPhone. And for those of you who don't have iPhones, the Android is coming soon. Um, I was told to say that. <laughs> I'm an iPhone guy. Um, so we can now hopefully track patients, understand where they live, support them and connect with them, and then actually they are given the opportunity, as we've seen in the registry, to donate information. What I hear in my clinic is, how can I help? I may not have resources to donate financially, but I can donate my information about the, how the disease has impacted me. That's incredibly important. Uh, it is an incredibly important gift that we need to honor, and this is another way in which I think we can do it. So I'm proud uh, to announce that, and uh, we have many uh, of our um, booths that I, I highly encourage you to stop by um, and touch base with uh, individuals that are driving the field in their own ways. And, and as Bill mentioned, it, it's not part of the agenda uh, that's listed in the pamphlet, but I want to emphasize we do have the clinical innovation series that's in this room at noon today. So uh, for those of you that are interested, we wanted to give the opportunity for you to hear directly from sponsors about the research that go that's going on for biotechnology as well as um, uh, novel uh, therapies that are being explored uh, moving forward. And lastly, I think it's uh, important that this event uh, has grown to the help of those in the community. Unfortunately, we lost one of our community earlier this year. Andy Tager, who was a, a really wonderful person, 
tremendous scientist and uh, someone who spoke highly of everyone in this room and was a really a wonderful collaborator. Unfortunately, he lost his battle uh, earlier this summer, so we wanted to at least dedicate in his memory the hard work that everyone has put forth for this meeting in memory of Andy. So um, I'd like to at least take an opportunity just to recognize his tremendous accomplishments. And we have another member uh, who's joined in our community over the past year. A few months ago, I was fortunate, and there were about 25 of us um, in the pulmonary fibrosis community, physicians, patients, uh, and loved ones that were affected by the disease. And we celebrated the opportunity for the PFF's first Hill Day while the, uh, during the ATS uh, a meeting in Washington, DC. It was a great opportunity for us to share our stories whether as a physician or as a patient or as a family member. And the group of individuals told lawmakers what it is like to have pulmonary fibrosis, how it impacts their lives, what resources are required, and what support is actually lacking, especially for a disease in which there is no cure. We've made tremendous steps forward and have identified therapies, but it's only the first step. We met with 54 elected officials and talked to them about the needs of the community. They were back-to-back -back meetings. It was a fairly long day, but it was phenomenal to see the, the acknowledgement and the need that, they, that we expressed to them and that they clearly identified was important for their constituents, as well as potentially their family members that we have identified. Um, we were lucky because we had an opportunity to talk to them, but we were also lucky because just as um, uh, Bill Schmidt had mentioned, we have emerging friends in the community with the ability to influence individuals and one of those individuals that stepped up to the plate, you'll understand the pun in a minute, um, as an advocate is a celebrity who is tremendously impactful in several arenas. He has a personal connection to the disease and is a tremendous spokesperson sharing his story, which is very similar to your story um, in the audience, whether you're a physician, patient, or, or caregiver. His name is Bernie Williams. You may recognize him. He's a former New York Yankee who has several <laughs> He has several World Series rings, which makes him special, and, and he certainly has a standout in that arena of his life. He's also a, a Grammy-nominated uh, musician, and we have the privilege of having him come to the stage uh, not only to share his uh, uh, music, but also share his story, the disbelief and sadness of when his father was diagnosed, and then unfortunately, when his father passed away. He's using that, that experience and sharing it with us and the commitment to help fight IPF moving forward. He's taking the passion he used on the field to make him one of the standout uh, players in the Major League Baseball, and now using that to help those in the community understand the significance of IPF and the ramifications of that diagnosis, and hopefully with, through that awareness, increase the understanding and increase the ability to care and better treat patients. So I want to say thank you first and foremost, but uh, secondarily uh, ask Bernie Williams please to, to come to the stage to share his spotlight with our groups. So Bernie, thank you so much for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Quite an honor, frankly. I know when I met you, you were um, still trying to understand the significance of the disease, even it's been almost 15 years since your father has passed away, yeah. and the impact that it's had on you, not only during his diagnosis and, and treatment, but subsequent and the years that, that followed. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. My, my um, you hear me? Yep, there you go. Uh, he was everything to us. Uh, he uh, was the one that taught me how to play. He was the one that taught me how to play uh, music. And uh, I'm having trouble with my. So it was, uh, it was really hard to uh, see him go through what he went through. 
uh, our whole family was devastated. Uh, I remember being eight, nine years old, uh, having my uh, first intro in introduction to what it was uh, to play music because he has a guitar. He had a guitar that he brought from his travels in, uh, as a merchant marine. Uh, and I remember being seven or eight years old and, and asking if he could teach me how to play. Uh, and I was really scared. <laughs> and, and he said, of course. And he, he taught me my first couple of chords. And from that moment, I developed this great love and passion for music. Um, and it was him that taught me how to play baseball. He took me out from uh, you know from school, and me and my brother, uh, to the baseball field. And uh, he spent the time, and he instilled in us all these like commitment and discipline values uh, that I still hold to this day. Uh, and he was a very athletic, out outgoing, very reserved in his you know in his speech, but. Uh, he was always out there doing something around the house uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, being very active in the community. Uh, he taught, you know, he coached uh, our little league teams for a while as well. And uh, he was, yeah, it was around that time that he started, uh, well, actually, when I started playing baseball with the Yankees, we started noticing uh, a lot of uh, uh, changes in his behavior you know obviously a proud man he didn't want to go to the hospitals or doctors or anything like that because he you know he thought and we thought he was superman um, and uh, he started changing he started feeling a lot you know tired fatigue uh, didn't want to go out as much uh, and uh, we really you know started noticing that in him and uh, up to the point that he started coughing a lot and uh, and uh, being really tired to walk and you know, fly the stairs, things that he would take for granted. He would take us to the, to the beach and run all the way through, and then, then he wouldn't do that anymore. And it's like, you guys go, you know, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, and you know, I'm pretty sure that this story is like very common to a lot of the stories that you've heard uh, or lived through. Uh, so I'm no different. Uh, he started uh, going to doctors when he really felt that he really needed to get his situation addressed. Uh, and it took us about five years to go from doctor to doctor to clinic to clinic saying, okay, you know, maybe it's just a uh, bad cold or oh, maybe it's just pneumonia or maybe it's just bronchitis. Or, and uh, it took us about five years when somebody actually said, dude, what you have is pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, I was like, well, so what's that? Okay, so he's going to be fine, right? So uh, no, he's not. Uh, and uh, that was just devastating for us and for him, you know. Uh, my brother and my mother were the ones that basically took the toll of, of taking care of him, uh, especially the later parts of, uh, of his life. I was playing baseball, I was out making sure that everything was fine and they had the best doctors and the best care. But uh, it was definitely weighing on my mind. Uh, and just to, uh, just to see him, I had an opportunity to see him the winter before uh, my next season uh, 15 years ago. And I had an opportunity to say goodbye to him in, in many ways uh, because he passed away during, uh, the regular, during my season uh, playing. Uh, they didn't tell me that he passed away. So they said, well, your dad is really sick. You got to go. Uh, and it was like the longest four-hour trip that I took from New York to Puerto Rico, and uh, he was already he already passed. Uh, so I never really had a chance to say goodbye to him, you know, before he passed away. But uh, uh, obviously, the toll on, on our family uh, uh, devastating, and uh, never really had an opportunity to uh, put closure to that, though, in many ways. Um, so when I was approached to uh, to be part of this uh, initiative to you know, be a spokesperson for pul uh, pulmonary fibrosis. It was uh, just, I think it was, uh, he had a little bit to do with it. You know, it's like if anything good can come out of this, you try to use your, whatever popularity you have to shed light into this issue and uh, you help save lives and help you know, get people better quality of life while they have this disease. And, uh, that's, you know, it has been uh, a blessing for me uh, to be part of this, and I'm uh, really happy to be here sharing my story.
I think your experience is very similar to many of those ind individuals in the audience, and you point out the areas that we want to try to improve upon, the, the delay in diagnosis, the misunderstanding as to what the disease is, and importantly, how we can effectively treat it. So um, with your help, I think we can make a huge difference. And I, I know we were talking before that there's the significance to some of the, the, the song that you're going to perform for us. There, you had some uh, comments you wanted to make to help the audience understand perhaps the, the meaning behind it. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, and every time I get to play music, I, it puts a smile on my face. Uh, I, you know, played uh, baseball for 16 years in the major leagues with uh, with the New York Yankees. I was part of, you know, whatever I was part of. I, no, I'm not trying to downplay it. It was some of the best times of my life. But the music and the artistic part has always been a very important part of my life as well. Maybe a little bit less known. Uh, but I started playing guitar when I was eight years old. Uh, my mother, she was an educator in the public education system in Puerto Rico, where I grew up. And uh, for her, academics were like, this is it. You guys get to do everything you want as long as you get good grades. Uh, but she enrolled us in this uh, performing arts high school, me and my brother, which, by the way, is a, uh, he's a cellist, but he's also a lawyer. So I don't know that. Uh. <laughs> Anyways, um, we, I started playing uh, music, and um, I had a great time. I, uh, my guitar, my music has always been a very important part of my life. When I retired in 2006, uh, it took me a couple of years, but I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's so much golf that you can play, I guess, when you're retired. Although I'm not really that good of a golfer anyways. <laughs> but anyways, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do my thing, do the, live the rest of my life, you know, trying to help people out, and I want to try to go back to music. So I went to the Manhattan School of Music in New York, and I went through the full... Uh, program, uh, four-year program, so I have a bachelor's degree in jazz performance out of that uh, school, so uh, hopefully it'll show in my playing at some point, but um, before I went to that school, uh, my dad died a couple of years before, and I sort of wrote this song, uh, which was uh, kind of my tribute to his life and uh, to give thanks to him and to God for having him in my life. Uh, the song is uh, Para Don Berna, his, uh, his nickname was Berna, uh, and I sort of wrote it for me and my brother to play it, uh, since uh, my brother cannot make it here because of his you know, situation in Puerto Rico with the hurricane and everything. Uh, I have a wonderful musician that is going to join me. Her name is Emily Nelson, uh, and uh, we sort of have gone over the song a few times. I think we're ready to play it, so without further ado, I, I hope you like it. It's Para Don Berna. Thank you. 